Okay, so, um, yeah, let me tell you a story about, um, this fisherman. A one-armed fisherman, one-eyed, or I should say not one-eyed Willie, but rather, uh, one-armed Charlie. So he's not a pirate, he's, he's a fisherman, and he's only got one arm, and he would always go to the village, and he would tell the story of the fish that took his arm. And he would say, you know, this fish that took my arm was really, really big. You know how big he was? He was this big. So, there's a reason I'm telling you this stupid, still, silly story. Um, and that is that a lot of times when people draw, they always draw worrying about this curve, right? They're always worried about their line work and trying to make the nice lines, and they're always trying to make the nice curves. And the problem is that when you're worrying about a curve, this is only one side of the shape. They are pulling a one-armed Charlie by just worrying and focusing about just that one side of the object that really you need to worry about both sides. So the thing is that when you're drawing both sides, when you do this thing with your hand and you draw, you, you hold both hands in front of you, you sense a presence between your two hands. You know, you say, you know, her, her tits were this big, you know, they, like the fish was this big. This is not enough. You need the two hands. The two hands don't, like, the, the, the one hand is just not enough. So, there's this presence that you're describing. And whenever you think of a person's, you know, if you're a blind person, um, actually, this is the perfect way to explain it, is that when you're drawing, you have to treat it as if you're, you're, drawing, you're drawing for blind people, okay? Because the, the thing is that without your drawing, they don't see anything. And... So they are blind to your ideas, and you have to make your ideas seen to people. You need to make your ideas visible to them. They're blind to your ideas, and so you have to describe to them the presence that is in your head, the, the, the idea. So, you know, how, if you're thinking of someone's head, you know, how big is that head? What are the, what's the presence? You have to describe that presence, that physical presence. That's what drawing is for. Drawing is, or that's, you know, art is articulation, art is... The articulation of ideas where we don't have telepathy, you can't bring it over to other people, so we need to draw it out for them. We need to describe it. So let's say we have a presence like this. So this is looks like kind of like a roll of duct tape. And you know, I'm now describing this presence to you. You know, you can look at it, pictures worth a zillion words, and you instantly have an idea of the presence. And I was saying earlier how it doesn't really matter what kind of curves you're using because I can draw, you know, using just straight curves like that. I can do this as well. This is why I say the curves don't matter, right? People are always focusing and trying to make those perfect curves. These are just, a, but like, in, in of themselves, they're just crappy little lines. They're crappy little lines, hastily drawn, and they still describe the form pretty well. And I could draw it in other ways. I could do it with scribbles, crappy little scribbles. In fact, these kind of maybe do a, a slightly, look, like, these, these fill in a lot more detail, but they still describe the same presence. The thing I'm trying to say is the presence isn't changing. Only the execution is changing, but the presence stays the same. It's the same object that I'm describing. We do it again like this. Oh. So... Even this is just, again, it's still the same presence, but you can kind of get the feeling that you've got this, this wire extrusion that forms this roll of duct tape. All three of these methods, very different. The presence that is being, descri that is being described is the same. Your lines, your curves, how nice, you know, these are wobbly lines. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You need to stop worrying about how good good your control of this is. I mean, you know, up to a point. You need to worry about it to the point where you don't have to worry about it anymore. So, your lines are subordinate to the presence. That means that the presence is always the same and, and that they follow the presence. They describe the presence. So, your lines are subordinate to the presence. But, the presence is described by your lines. So, it means that other people will not know what you have in mind 
unless you draw the damn thing. And unfortunately, there's this fly in the ointment, um, something which is going to complicate matters. This is the thing that, that, that makes things difficult when people focus entirely on the curves, and that is the problem of, well, drift. Yeah, I drew them with my eyes closed to show you the problem of drift, right? Because the thing is, you shut your eyes and you draw, and the moment you lift up your pen and move somewhere else, you're like, where was I? I lost my place. And then I'm suddenly, I, I had this presence in mind, this very, very strong presence, but I've lost registration of where I am on the presence. I've lost my absolute positioning. And so I've drifted off course, and then now the ears, like, <laughs> the, the, the features are being misplaced on the overall structure, even though the curves are, you know. So yeah, you have to deal with this drift problem. And it's like, if I take that same roll of duct tape and I try to draw it again, so I'm going to go around, and then I'm going to go out, then I'm going to go around, down, around, in, around, up, around, out, around, down, around, in, around, up, around, out, around, down, around, in, around, up, around, out. So I have this problem of drift, right? Like, this one doesn't look nearly as good as, you know, this one, right? That's because I, I traced this one, right? I, I, had, I, tr I had this diagram here, and I just traced over it. That's why this one's so perfect. Because when you trace a thing, right, the presence is already described. It's already perfect. But the problem is that when I draw this as one single curve, we get this horrendous drift. Like, you wind up going off course. So I want to introduce you to a thing I call bracketing. So bracketing is, instead of doing one-armed Charlie, we're doing two-armed Hannibal. Okay. So in this case, I can bracket. I can say, well, the duct tape is this wide. And maybe there's an internal part of it that's, you know, the whole inside is like that. So I can just, I don't even have to say how long those lines are, right? I can make longer lines. I can say the inside is maybe like this. And maybe the, the duct tape, at least on some of its axes, is maybe about that thick. And maybe we've got a tilt on the thing, right? So it's not, we're not looking at it straight on, but we've got a bit of a tilt. And this is where we get into spatial bracketing. So, you know, there's, this is this, or I can keep bracketing around by doing these little markings here. So you can see how I'm rapidly describing this object. And it doesn't require the, the greatest of control because every time I draw one of these little markings, I take my hand off. I look at the overall thing and I evaluate the drift. So there's positive bracketing. So these, of these skills, there is positive bracketing. So positive bracketing is when you are adding to the shape. You're creating additional mass to this object. Then there is negative bracketing. So I looks like I skipped a bit. So if I have negative bracketing, what that is is where I might, I might bracket off a whole object like this and then decide to cut into it. And then now it's negative. So I've created concavity into this. Then we have spatial bracketing. So spatial bracketing is the use of this distance thing, right? Trying to make it so that you use shorter lines and you space things out to make it feel as if some lines are closer than others. Or if the lines are maybe coming towards the camera, like that. So there's actually there's, there's two ways to do this. There's, this is what I call laminar bracketing or laminar flow bracketing, and then you've got cross. This is cross bracketing. So you've got cross and laminar, two ways to go about doing it. Then there's volumetric description. The volumetric description is we're going to, let's say I, buy, I look at a cylinder. All right. so right now, this thing doesn't really, it looks still kind of flat. But what I can do is I can look at the cross section of this cylinder and I can find correlating points. So if I look at the two center points, I will correlate those two center points or I can correlate these two edges, those two edges. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep filling the cylinder by using the same technique. 
gradually filling it up with sticks. Just just a big bundle of sticks. I I love I love drawing great bundles of sticks. There's nothing I enjoy more than drawing large bundles of sticks. Right? So you can do a volumetric description. It's like drawing a bundle of toothpicks or a bundle of sticks. Then there's arc segmentation. The arc segmentation is we can draw a segment of an arc. So your your lines can be curved. They don't have to be straight lines. So I can draw arc segments and use these to draw the roll of duct tape. And this is just another form this is just laminar flow bracketing with curvature in the lines. Works great. We use some now I can describe like this. This is probably faster, or I can go I can do cross form. So actually this is the laminar, whereas the other lines were the cross form. And then you can see how I'm purposefully curving this. Just hatching. Right? Using arc segments. So that's all. Now go away and draw. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, go away. Go away. Or I can I can make you go away by talking about the technical reasons as to why this is kind of new to people. And so there's this problem where, you know, the human eye has the um you know, we've got central vision. So you've got central central, central vision and peripheral vision. There's the vision where you're looking straight at a thing. And then there's the kind of vision where, you know, things are off to the side. All right, so you got this little five degree cone, which is your central vision, eight degree cone, paracentral, 18 degree cone, you know, which is your macular area. And so, you know, your eye has differing amounts of receptors on the retina. And you've got, this is basically telling us about the number of receptors per square millimeter. That means like a little teeny pissant dot, okay? Little teeny pissant dot in the five degree cone in your central vision. It's like this, look, let's see, if these lines are all like 10 degree, that means that like this is the five degree cone. So right in that little, like not even five, that's like a, like a one degree cone, you know? That's like a, that's a puny ass one degree cone. The thing has, <laughs> you know, per millimeter square, the thing has, 150,000 receptors in that one little teeny dot. That little teeny dot. And there's a lot of processing power in that little tiny dot. And you can see how quickly that detail just drops off. Now you've got cones and you've got rods. Okay, these are two kinds of receptors. Cone receptors sense color and they're used to sense detail. In fact, you can see off to the side. There's hardly anything here. Okay, maybe that's that's twenty thousand. That means that that's oh these are these okay so that's ten thousand. That's like five thousand. You got five thousand on the outer per millimeter square. Okay, you got way more, <laughs> way more, like exponentially more in the center. And one thing about cones is that they are daytime vision only, bright light, color vision. Nighttime, you use rod. You use rod sensors, and rod receptors are good at night vision, but you'll notice that the rod receptors poof, drop off in that central vision. This is why when it's really, really, you know, late at night, it's really dark, and your eyes have adjusted to the dark, don't look directly at things, because if you look directly at them, you're going to bathe them in the awe and magnificence of your cones, which can't see jack shit in the middle of night, <laughs> okay? So you actually, if you want to see something pretty clearly, you're going to have to stare maybe... Look at that. About 20 degrees. You're going to have to stare about 20 degrees off to the side so that your that ring of cones, that, that ring of, sorry, the ring of rods, which can really, really sense things well in the night, can see the object. So you're going to have to kind of disobey your instincts to look directly at things. You're going to have to look 20 degrees off to the side to pick up things in the, in the dark, which is great because it's like, you know, whenever they have the horror, the horror movies and the, 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 the predator can see in the dark and the predator is lurking at you in the darkness... And he's going to attack you. And the first thing you do is you look at him. And what happens? He disappears. That's not great. So always look 20 degrees off to the side. Okay? 
then you can see what it's going to kill you and maybe dodge it. So the thing is that there's a lot of this processing power which is devoted to the central vision. Just scads, enormous amounts of conic vision is devoted to the central vision. And the problem is that when people draw and draw curves, they focus right on the little pen point. They're not looking at the big picture. They're looking at where that little thing is, right? They're always worrying about that little curve that they're trying to draw. And what happens is it's like, well, these receptors consume a certain amount of optic bandwidth of your visual cortex, okay? Your brain, the part, the graphics card in your brain, okay? Unfortunately, it can only deal with so much at, so, at a time. And I don't think we're, we're quite able to handle the fine detail in the middle. If we, if we focus and we really put our attention on that fine detail in the middle, I don't think our brains really handle that so well. What happens is that it's, it comes kind of at a price. We, we start staring and reading things off in the distance, and all of a sudden, we, we just forget about the rods. Fuck the rods. We don't care about them. We just don't pay attention to the rods, and they, they, we lose our overall picture. But we can still read things far away. Okay. And so this is probably why people, why this, this problem is so prevalent. Why nobody understands presence when they, like, they understand presence when they're not drawing, but the moment they pick up a pen, they just, their brain just, just turns to oatmeal. Just turns to oatmeal because they're reading this little teeny thing and they've lost a sense of the presence. They've lost a sense of the things around them. So that's, that's my theory as to why this is happening. I think somebody would probably have to, have to wire some electrodes inside somebody's brain and measure the activity of their brain, you know, and, and then get them to focus on little things off in the distance or, or like small things and get them to read stuff. And, and then also try to get them to defocus their eyes and then try to get an overall picture of a thing and, you know, measure the activities. But until some scientist actually sit, comes along and, and, and studies this kind of thing, I don't know. This is all just pure conjecture. Okay, now really, seriously, go away. Go away. Go away. Go. Where's, where's, the, where's the stop button? Go. Yes. Where? Stop. Where's the... <laughs> I've lost my mouse cursor. All right, go away. 